Hey, how's it going, everybody? Charlie Wilson here, A.K. Sinister Charlie. Welcome back. Uh, got some more fat electrician, as per usual. Um, this one is pretty recent, uh, and it's a long one, so I'm gonna hunker down. And uh, <laughs> uh, if you guys don't know, I have a back problem, so yeah, I try to I try to not sit through really long videos, but um, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess let's get into it. Uh, RAFs, I don't know what that is. Uh, legless Antihero, Sir Douglas Bader. Uh, let's go. I, I said go. You know somebody's an absolute gangster when they're not an American, and I'm still going to make a video about them. <gasps> Whack. Today we're talking about Sir Douglas Bada, a World War II British RAF fighter pilot ace with at least 22 confirmed kills, and he managed to do all of that as a double amputee with no legs, which I think we can all agree is a pretty impressive feat. Oh, I think uh, Family Guy, this is weird. I think Family Guy might have referenced this. <laughs> when, uh, I, I can't remember the clip exactly, but I think they did. Well, have you lost me spirit, I'll have it. But first, a word from our sponsor, because this video is brought to you by Permasafe. All right, here's the deal. Permasafe is not the average set of rubber gloves that you've seen at the hospital before. These things are designed for people that work outside of a clinical gloves. setting Good. with their hands that still don't want to touch something gross or something hazardous. Your paramedics, your law enforcement officers, construction workers. I, I don't mind touching gross things. Just put that. Mechanics, farmers, <laughs> anybody that's working a manual labor job where typical rubber gloves simply aren't going to hold up, you have Permasafe. These things have diamond texture on the palms mm. so that even if your hands mm. get greasy or wet, you still have traction and you're able to grab stuff. They're also twice as thick and four times more puncture and tear resistant. Okay, check this out. Okay, look at this. I'm checking. That's like half a gallon of water inside this rubber glove oh, right now. No, not in the office. That's quality oh. jiggling right there. Okay, I'm pretty sure this is what the Hulk's thought you were going to stab it. I, I'm sorry to pause on his ad, but I, I thought you were going to stab it or something. Jeans are made out of. Oh, no. Now my hands are all wet from filling up that other glove with a bunch of water. Listen to all the traction and grip I still have with these goddamn gloves. And here's the best part about these. You don't have to go to a special website. You don't have to follow my link. You don't have to use my discount code. You can just go to Amazon. They are on Amazon Prime. You can order these and have them at your house tomorrow. And I know what you're thinking, but chubby electron guy, I don't need rubber gloves. Okay, listen to me. Rubber gloves are like jumper cables and condoms. You never need them until you need them. Just trust me on this one. Go to Amazon, buy yourself I a box of Permasafe you. gloves, keep them in your car, in your garage, and at some point in the future, you're going to be holding something absolutely disgusting in your hands. You're going to be like, wow, fat electrician was right. This was definitely worth the money. So yeah, get yourself some Permasafe gloves because shit happens. It just doesn't have to happen on your hands. Back to the video. Yay. All right, Douglas Bader, born in London in 1910. World War I was going on when he was a child. His father and his older brother-in-law both fought in World War I. His father was an engineer and his brother-in-law was a fighter pilot. Because of that, young Douglas knew that he wanted to be a fighter pilot too. So fast forward, 1928, Bada's 18 years old. He just graduated from high school. He immediately joins the RAF as a cadet pilot as well as going to Cambridge for college and while doing that he would become a star athlete for both organizations while at Cambridge he would play hockey box and become a star at hockey in uh, England that's uh, okay it's weird. Our rugby player. Right. Apparently, he was so good at rugby that it was believed that after college, he would join the national team to represent his country. And then for the RAF, he would end up playing on their official cricket team. I have no idea what cricket is, and I really don't care to learn. Nobody don't. understands well, cricket. You got to know what a crumpet is to understand cricket. I mean, yeah. yeah, I thought crumpet was the mountain that the Grinch lived on, so obviously I have no idea what's going on. Fast forward again, two years, 1930. He's still going to college at Cambridge, but he graduates from a cadet to a full-fledged commissioned pilot in the RAF, at which point he becomes known as an absolute daredevil while also being extremely talented. He can pull off every aerial maneuver known to man at this point, including some that are so dangerous that they're banned. And not only does he do those maneuvers, he does them below 2,000 feet, which is also against the rules because it's extremely dangerous. But Bader doesn't care about rules. He doesn't care what you tell him. That's Bader's just guidelines. He's going to do what he wants. Because of that, he actually gets selected to represent his squadron at the Hendon Air Show in a flying competition, which he wins. Then later that year in 1931, he is preparing to go defend his title at the Hendon Air Show in early 1932, at which point oh no. he tries this a dangerous maneuver well. too close to the ground, and the wing of his Bristol Bulldog catches the ground, crashes the entire plane, crushing his legs. 
Because of this, both of his legs would have to get amputated, one above the knee and one just below the knee. At this point, you have to remember it's the 1930s. He is told that he is never going to be able to walk yeah, again without imagine. crutches. And that's what they believed because nobody had ever done it before. But you also have to remember, Bada doesn't care what people tell him. The same attitude that got him into this mess by not listening to the rules is the same attitude that's going to get him out of this mess by not listening to what the experts tell him he's going to be capable of doing. Over the course of his rehabilitation, not only does he regain the ability to walk without crutches or a cane, something he was told was going to be impossible, he also regains the ability to drive his sports car, golf, Word and up, dance, dude. all on Get dual it. prosthetics. And he managed to do all of that in four months, essentially by himself, because all the experts thought it was impossible. It wasn't like modern day where there's an expert that has a refined process on how to help somebody out in his situation. No, this man blazed the entire path on his own with no background in physical therapy. He just figured it out. So fast forward June 1932, five months after losing both of his legs, he shows back up to the RAF like, hey guys, made a full recovery. Let's get me up in one of those planes so I can take it for a spin. At which point they tell him, absolutely not. You don't have your legs. We're not going to let you fly. He then argues with the RAF. To which I have a story. I um, <clears throat> When I was in Iraq, uh, we were at the, uh, the galley or mess hall, if you're, I guess, in the army. Um, but yeah, we're going through and Gary Sinise is there and I've met him once before that in Chicago. But he was there getting food at the uh, in the galley, and uh, somebody yells out, "Hey, Lieutenant Dan, you got your legs back!" It was pretty funny. He he's just like looks at him. He goes, "It, it was it was fun times." Which Sorry, I just thought about the no legs. They're gonna let him have a test flight with another pilot. And if he does good, everything should be fine. So that's exactly what they do. He takes a plane up, he does a bunch of maneuvers, he lands the plane, all with the use of his prosthetic legs. No problem whatsoever because he is a phenomenal pilot. He then gets cleared by a medical board saying that he is fit for active duty and he is reinstated as a pilot. Fast forward one year later, April 1933, the RAF for seemingly no reason decided that they were going to reverse that decision and ground him because there was nothing in the King's regulations in regards to to a legless pilot. To which Bada's like, yeah, no shit. I'm the first guy that's ever done it ever. That's why you guys put me through all that testing that damn and King a wasn't board thinking to see if I could do time. it. And I've been doing it for the last year. Why would you ground me now? To which the RAF was like, don't really care. That's what we decided. Fuck you. Get out of the plane. Bada mm -hmm. is then informed that he has to pick a new job where he stays on the ground. And Bada, being a man of his stature, isn't going to stand for that shit. So uh -huh. he retires <laughs> early. Right. From there, he spends the next couple of years collecting his military pension, working a desk job, golfing 36 holes a day. He also Jesus. meets his wife and starts to settle down. Then over the course of 1937, 1938, Douglas would write the air ministry multiple times saying, hey, if the next world war is going to kick off, let me know. I'm happy to come back and fly a plane for you. Then fast forward, sure enough, September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland, World War II kicks off, and the RAF finally decides to call back Douglas Bob. Hey, So Douglas shows back up at an RAF base and he is pumped because last time he was flying planes was eight years ago and they were like old biplanes like his Bristol Bulldog. Now they got Spitfires, they got Hurricanes. They got planes have come a long and ways in eight years and he scabbles. is absolutely thrilled to be able to get up and fly one. And at this point, RAF leadership yet again informs Douglas, oh, we're not actually going to let you fly a plane. You don't have any legs. That would be preposterous. Ooh. We thought you wanted to join the war effort and do a ground job just to help out. No. At which point... Douglas is furious. I would be I am a pissed. peacock! You gotta let me fly! Luckily, however, some of the people that Douglas had served with prior eight years ago were now higher ranking officers and they had some pull and they convinced the higher leadership to give this guy a shot because he's an incredible pilot. So the higher ups finally agree to give Douglas a shot, but that shot entails him going back through flight school all over oh again, God. which he does. And after his first 11 hours of flying with an instructor, he is finally allowed to take up a plane on his own. And the first thing he does is invert it and fly it upside nice. down at a low altitude <laughs> right past all the instructors. Basically giving all of the instructors the middle finger. He then peels off and goes and does a bunch of other maneuvers. And you have to realize this is the first time he's been inside of the cockpit of a plane That's by himself be a good in like a decade. And last time he was flying a plane solo, it was his Bristol Bulldog, which is a biplane. And now he's flying a Spitfire. This is a huge upgrade grade and he is blown away at how incredible this plane handles he's able to take turns and pull off maneuvers way tighter and way faster than he ever would have dreamed of being able to do inside of a biplane and initially he gives all the credit to the new air
airplane and how advanced aircrafts have become. But then over the course of a little bit more training, he starts to realize not all the other pilots can pull off these turns and maneuvers as tight and as fast as he can inside of the Spitfire. They have the same plane. Is he just that much better than these guys or what is going on? And then it dawns on him. Well, you ain't got no legs, Lieutenant Dane. No. Yes, I know that. He realizes yeah, it was all because of G-Force, because when a pilot... I figured there'd be a Gary Sinise reference somewhere in here. You'd figure there'd have to be. ...that takes a turn or does a maneuver, they're exposed to G-Force, and if they do it too fast or too tight, they're exposed to too much G-Force. Nice guy, all by the, the way. All the blood in their body sense. rushes down to their legs, and they lose consciousness. Okay, you see where this is going? Doug doesn't have any legs for the blood to rush to. G-Force is just Viagra to this guy oh. at this point. Dude is literally the real-life version of Star Fox. Yeah, that remember the is, Nintendo video you know, game? You ever notice how Star Fox and every... I, you know, that does... I was thinking, I was like, you know, yeah. Yeah, that he doesn't... Yeah. That's a good, that's a, um, I guess we should start taking the legs off of pilots. Everybody in his crew all have metal <laughs> legs. According to the internet oh. lore, it's because they all had their legs amputated to resist G-Force more. In a I did not know that backstory for Star Fox. Sorry, I'm pausing it, but, uh. Huh, I never even noticed that with the metal legs. Twist of fate, his disability has turned into a physical advantage inside the cockpit of a fighter plane. He quite literally has a leg up on the competition. And because of this, it. a lot of other fighter pilots and high-ranking officers in the RAF start to not like Bada because they claim that he's arrogant and difficult to work with because here he Better is continue. getting told he's never going to walk again. Not only does he walk again, he learns how to golf, he learns how to drive a car, and now here he is out-piloting most of them. What an arrogant prick. Luckily, Doug doesn't really give a shit. He's not here to make friends. He's here to win a war, and that's exactly what See. he sets about doing. His first combat mission is over the skies of Dunkirk during Operation oh. Dynamo. If you don't know, this is the operation where they had to evacuate the entire British military from Dunkirk. I yes, know this movies. is what the movie Dunkirk is about. If you don't know, <laughs> basically when Germany took movies. over France using their new Blitzkrieg tactic, they took over France so fast that the British army couldn't even get a foothold inside of France to start fighting back. The entire military was caught and surrounded in the city of Dunkirk, and they had to evacuate their entire army barely making it out with their lives. And Douglas Botta was in the skies over Dunkirk in a Spitfire running defense for these guys while they got evacuated. During this time, Botta claimed to have shot down five German Messerschmitt BF 109s, but he was only officially credited with shooting down one and potentially damaging several others. Because every time Botta says that he shot down an enemy plane, it is extremely scrutinized because again, a lot of the other fighter pilots and leadership don't like him because they think Aww. he's an arrogant prick. So literally every plane that Botta is is officially credited with shooting notice like all these stories that he's telling uh it's about like individuals it's usually like the officers that are um a bunch of real jerks is you know what i say yeah but that that's natural i guess down has been spotted by him his wingmen and an independent third party on the ground to verify that he shot that plane down before they would give him credit for it. Boo. But that's besides the point. Whether he shot down one enemy or five ultimately doesn't really matter because Douglas Botta and the rest of the RAF were able to hold off the German Air Force from bombing the men on the ground long enough for the entire British military to get evacuated so that they could live to fight another day. And because of this, Douglas was promoted to squadron leader and given command of Squadron 242, or at least what was left of it. You see, Squadron 242 was a bunch of Canadian hurricane pilots that had been stationed in France and had been fighting the Luftwaffe for a while and they had sustained heavy losses and their morale was cripplingly low. <laughs> Bada comes in as their new leader, turns the entire squadron <laughs> around, takes a squadron in shambles <laughs> and turns them into an effective fighting force again. Cutting through red tape and bureaucratic bullshit picture. to get his men what they needed to be successful. And because of this, even more of his peers and the chain of command starts to like him less because he is sticking up for his subordinates. And to me, this is the most important part of the entire story because What's as that? this story continues to go on you're going to notice that the more successful this man becomes the more and more some people tend to not like him and try to trash his reputation i have watched countless interviews of other people talking about their relationship with douglas botta when he was alive and all of their opinions can be summed up into one of two opinion number one he is a literal superhero opinion number two he was an arrogant prick but even i can't deny he was a good fighter pilot and oddly enough all of the people that thought he was an arrogant prick were fighter pilots that were in an adjacent unit or leaders that were in an adjacent unit, uh, not his unit, because his chain of command absolutely loved him and all of the men that served underneath him. You know, they usually say that about uh, sports teams. Um, you know, if they're arrogant, you hate, if they're not on your team and they're uh, 
and they're arrogant, you know. If they're on your team, you'll love them, I guess. Also, absolutely Whatever loved him. To give you an idea of how highly his <laughs> men thought of him, one of the pilots that served underneath him, Sir Alan Smith, later in life said in an interview about the time that Douglas Botta made him second in command for a mission, it felt like God had told me to come up and keep an eye on heaven for him. Which to me says everything, because I think how you're perceived by your subordinates is a far better metric of your character than how See. you are seen by the people competing against you for a promotion. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're wrong because I read on the internet one time that somebody's grandpa met him once during World War II and that guy's grandpa told him that Douglas Botta wasn't very polite. Uh. Jesus Christ. Okay, first of all, word of mouth four degrees removed is not a reputable source, so I don't really care. Second of all, even if that was true, let's put it into so perspective. What? Your grandpa met the guy while he was in World War II. Okay, so at this point in time, Douglas Botta is literally a legless man in the biggest ass kicking contest the world has yeah, ever I think seen. He deserves and he's it, winning. Even okay, even the guy's true. probably got a lot on his it's plate. Okay. It wouldn't surprise me if he was a little stressed out and maybe angry sometimes. Okay, shit happens. Get over it. You know what? I'm sorry. I'm getting sidetracked. It just really, really annoys me when people that have never met somebody go out of their way to shit on their legacy for doing something incredible because it makes them feel better about themselves. Anyways, moving on. All right, fast forward to right. July 1940. Douglas <laughs> and Squadron up, 242 are going to partake in the defense of Great Britain during the Battle of Britain, which, if you don't know, is a period in time between July and October of 1940 where the Germans essentially tried to bomb Great Britain every single day. During this time, Squadron 242 is credited with shooting down 62 enemies and only having four of their own shot down. Of those 62 enemies that were shot down, Four of them were shot down by Douglas Botta. This would bring his career total to five, officially making him an ace fighter pilot. Because of this, news outlets pick up the story and they begin to portray Douglas as the hero of the Battle of Great Britain, essentially using him for pure propaganda. Like, yeah. hey, check this out. Great Britain has a legless fighter ace and he is helping to win the war against the Nazis. We literally have a legless man beating you guys in an ass kicking contest. What's up? So now Douglas is getting all this attention. He's being used for effective propaganda, which is great, but it also serves to drive the divide even further between him and the other fighter pilots that already didn't like him because now they're jealous that he's getting a bunch of attention for doing just as well as a lot of them did. And if that wasn't bad enough, it's he's natural. now also on the shit list of the really high ranking officers in the RAF because he had the audacity to back up his boss and friend, Lee Mallory. Basically the standard operating procedure for the RAF during the defense of Britain was kind of like aerial guerrilla tactics. As soon as they identified an incoming bombing run, they would scramble a small group of RAF fighters that would go up and utilize hit and run tactics to shoot down the bombers. Lee Mallory, on the other hand, thought that they should respond with overwhelming force in a strategy that he referred to as the big wing. And this was essentially taking somewhere between three and five squadrons in one giant formation, like 50 to 70 fighter planes all at once and running right towards the bombing runs. And Douglas agreed that this was a good strategy and he was a huge proponent of it. Ultimately, throughout the Battle of Britain, the big wing was only used five times. Of the five times that it was used, the men that flew in the formation said that it was incredibly effective and they shot down a bunch of enemies. The men that did not fly in the formation said that it wasn't as effective as they're claiming it was and that they're lying. So that aspect is kind of an unknown, but we do know for certain that planes flying in the big wing formation were safer because their safety in numbers, that makes sense. They were less likely to get shot down. The downside of the big wing was that it took a lot of time to get that many planes up in the air and in formation, so response time was lower. So as far as which plane was better aerial guerrilla warfare or the big wing i'm not really sure but one thing is for certain using both of them multiple times had a beneficial effect because the first time the big wing was used all the german pilots were being told that great britain only had 10 15 20 aircrafts left and they go out on this bombing huh. run and here comes 70 spitfires and hurricanes and just fucks up their whole day it had a devastating effect yeah. on enemy morale and you, on you probably don't want to lie to your people about uh how much how the enemy's doing it doesn't generally work out very well it's not it's not good propaganda top of that now they don't know what the british tactics are they have to both anticipate being attacked with overwhelming numbers and being attacked with a small fast responsive hit and run force which made it very difficult for the germans to plan their attacks because now they had to plan for both overwhelming numbers and a fast responsive force so yeah in addition to his newfound fame people are also upset that he had the audacity to have an opinion of how to conduct aerial warfare even though oh, he's an ace fighter you. pilot and presumably an expert in aerial warfare but 
whatever. Regardless, Douglas ends up getting a promotion to Wing Commander, and he is now in charge of three squadrons instead of one. So then, from late 1940 to August of 1941, Douglas and his men take the fight to the Germans, flying hundreds of missions, shooting down a ton of Germans. Douglas himself shoots down an additional 17, bringing his career total to 22, six probables, and a bunch more shared. But on August 9th, 1941, Douglas Botta would fly his last mission ever when he would collide in midair with a German Messerschmitt BF-109. Somehow, Douglas survives the initial impact, but his plane is absolutely going down. Oh. So he quickly opens <laughs> the canopy and goes to climb out of the plane, but the impact the has movie. crushed one of his prosthetic legs inside the cockpit, and he can't get out. So he's pulling on it, he's pulling on it, he's desperately trying to get out of this plane and time is running out he only has a few seconds left and he says fuck it it's worth a shot and he opens his parachute while still inside oh. the plane well i mean yeah his parachute catches wind and rips him out of his prosthetic and out of the cockpit he then attempts to evade german capture hopping around Jeez. on a single prosthetic leg he is eventually captured and becomes a prisoner of war okay now to be fair technically we don't know for sure that it was a mid-air collision that he was involved in because his plane was never recovered and like i said everything douglas reports back is extremely scrutinized because leadership doesn't like him oh, and they yeah. came to the conclusion that douglas made up the mid-air collision story because he didn't want to have to admit that he was shot down and bested oh, by a german on. pilot and the reasoning for that is that the german documentation captured after the war didn't show that there was any mid-air collision around this time period here's a caveat to that the documentation also didn't show that they shot down douglas either so now the leading theory is that he was actually a victim of friendly fire somehow which you know what to be fair as much as i want to have bottas back on this one if you take a step back and really look at it it does make perfect sense because what person in their right mind would take the word of their own guy who was fucking there and lived through it yeah. over the word of the German military in the 1940s? I mean, the Germans back then were just batting 100. They never fucking lied about anything ever. They ever. definitely didn't build an entire military in secrecy, violating the Treaty of Versailles so they could try to take over the fucking planet. And they definitely didn't have a crazy military dictator dosed up on amphetamines and testosterone who people he was were feeling scared to give him bad news <laughs> there's no way that they would lie on this documentation all right so back to douglas he's hanging out at this pow camp with one prosthetic leg word finally gets spread around throughout britain and throughout the german ranks that they finally caught the famous legless fighter ace that the british had and upon hearing that one of germany's most famous fighter pilot aces adolf Galland, who had apparently been running missions against bada for a while now wanted to go meet him in person and for whatever reason he's actually nice to bada so nice yeah, that mean... he actually writes the british government and is like hey we got your guy he's missing one of his legs would you guys mind airdropping another prosthetic for That's him so nice. he could walk around to which britain is like absolutely sure why not great britain launches operation leg where they are given free passage through german airspace to airdrop an extra prosthetic leg for bada That's and then nice. after dropping the leg they kept going and bombed the local power okay. plant. okay look if you're not cheating you're not trying you don't like it don't what try if... to take over the entire world i mean it's kind of a jerk move man come on I don't know what else to tell you. So now that Bada's got both his legs, he decides it is going to be his personal mission to be the biggest pain in the ass humanly possible. He is going to constantly try to escape the POW camp, and he is going to fuck with the guards every chance he gets, or as he calls it, goon baiting. One of his first attempts at escape, he's on like the third story of a hospital, so he takes all the bed sheets he can find, ties them together on a rope, just like you see in the movies, ties it to the radiator in the room, throws the rope out the window, but the rope isn't long enough, and he's looking around, he's like, shit. What else can I use? There's a guy in a coma that he's sharing the room with. So he ties mm -hmm. the rope to that guy's bed frame and pushes the guy in the coma bed over to the window to get it close enough to the ground. He repels down to the ground and runs off, but the Germans catch him again. Then after he gets out of the hospital, he goes to a normal POW camp where he tries to Andy Dufresne his way out. He tries to Andy dig a Dufresne. tunnel out of the POW camp mm -hmm. using That's his prosthetic right. leg as a shovel and taking all the excess dirt that he has putting it inside of his prosthetic leg and walking away with it before falling down to dump out all the excess dirt so they never see any big dirt piles. But eventually that plan gets busted too. And then in August of 1942, after a year in captivity, he finally makes it out of 
the POW camp. He escapes and he's gone for like 36 hours. They put out a nationwide manhunt. They're getting posters ready. They are absolutely gonna find this guy. They were getting their ass kicked by him in aerial combat. There is no way that these guys are gonna admit that a man with no legs was able to escape their POW camp. Eventually they do end up tracking him down, take him back into custody, at which point they decide they're gonna send him to Colditz Castle, which is believed to be an inescapable prison, which is apparently where he has to go because they are absolutely not gonna let the yeah, guy with no legs get away. And that is where he would remain until 1945 when the US Army liberated him and returned him home. From there, he would receive a hero's welcome, retire from the RAF, and then a movie would be made about his life called Reach for the Sky. It is considered to be a classic piece of British oh, film, out. and it made him one of the most famous men on the planet at this point in time. He then decided that he was going to use all of his newfound fame to put out the message that it was still possible to accomplish things after a horrific yeah. injury and becoming disabled. And he became one of, if not the biggest advocate for disabled people on the planet. For this service to the world, he would end up getting knighted by the queen and officially become Sir Douglas Botta. He would then continue to travel and give talks and advocate for the rest of his life until passing away at the age of 72 on September 5th, 1982. But one of those talks that he gave is actually my favorite part of this entire story because it really captures how much of an anti-hero Douglas Botta really was. He was giving a speech at an all-girls school telling his incredible story about being a pilot during World War II. And at some point during that story, he says, and I quote, so there were two of the fuckers behind me, three of the fuckers <laughs> to my right, and another fucker on the left. Uh, at this awesome. point, the audience is like, and the headmistress of the school has all the color drained from her face and she goes ghost white. And she's like, ladies, ladies, a fucking is a German aircraft. At which point, Sir Douglas Bader okay. replies, and I quote, that may be madame, but these fuckers were Messerschmitts. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go check out thefatelectrician.com. Uh, good old British. Get some merch, subscribe to Patreon. Oh, uh, and I did get, uh, I bought a shirt. So that should be coming uh, probably next week. So I, I, did, I did promise I would buy one. So I did. Thanks for watching. Quack bang out. The lengths oh. haters will go to just to hate will never, ever. Yeah, you put. Yeah, it. comment section. I see you, you bunch of haters. Everybody's actually really nice in my comment sections, so I like that. <laughs> comment section, pretty nice. People very friendly, and we like to joke around about stuff. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, that was a good one. I like that. Uh, oh, and my my little video is a little off. Uh, chroma key's not chroma. -y. Um, all right, there you go. There's your uh, daily dose of fat electrician. Um, yeah, thanks for watching, everybody. I really appreciate it. Please like you and subscribe you down below. Makes me feel good inside. Um, yeah, and if you got any suggestions, put those in the comments as well. Uh, be friendly, bunch of haters. All right, uh. Bye.